Very, very good. Well, good afternoon and welcome. It's good to see so many friends from, of Syracuse and from the community here. I look around, I see people from our School of Information Studies, from some of our colleges, the uh, forestry, uh, from downtown, the public library, uh, Onondaga Historical Society. Uh, our speaker, of course, is from Cornell, so part of the region. Um, it's wonderful. Thank you for, for all of you for coming out this afternoon. My name is Christian DuPont, and I'm the director of the Special Collections Research Center here in Syracuse University Library. Joan, Bill, we've looked forward to this day for a long time. <laughs> it's here. Here we are. And you're here. <laughs> but, Bonin, but, uh, but Joan and Bill uh, Brodsky have, uh, have looked forward to this day really longer than all of us. Both Bill and Joan completed their undergraduate degrees at SU, as well as graduate degrees, Bill in Law and Joan in Information Studies, finishing their studies and leaving campus uh, in 1968 to begin their lives together. But for all their successes beyond SU, Bill is now CEO of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, and Joan has dedicated herself to the educational advancement and learning through her service as a public school librarian and a teacher. The Brodskys have kept coming back to Syracuse to serve the university with their time and their financial support. Bill was a university trustee from 1987 until his promotion to emeritus status in 2003. He has also served on the Board of Visitors of the College of Law. Joan is currently a member of the Board of Visitors of the School of Information Studies. The Brodskys have been named members of the Chancellor's Council in recognition of their support of many advancement initiatives at Syracuse University, including renovation of the Hall of Languages, construction of the Shine Student Center, the Michael O. Sawyer Chair of Constitutional Law and Politics in the Maxwell School, and more recently, the Eleanor and Marcus I. Breyer Digital Learning Center at the School of Information Studies, in honor of Joan's parents, and the Winnick Hillel Center for Jewish Life. All three of the Brodsky's children, Michael, Stephen, and Jonathan, received undergraduate degrees from Syracuse University in the 1990s. It would be hard to point to another family with more love for this institution and a stronger commitment to its ongoing welfare. The idea to create an endowment to advance and promote knowledge of library conservation was inspired by Joan's passionate interest in the traditional arts of book production and her experience working as a volunteer in conservation facilities, including the Newberry Library and Spurtis Museum in Chicago. It was Joan and Bill who came to our library to ask what they could do to bring our unique and strong resources in conservation to greater attention and benefit. I should mention here, even by way of explanation as to why we are in this room and not some larger hall, that our conservation is located, conservation lab is located just down the hall, and we hope you'll take time to visit it afterward the lecture uh, during our reception. We'll open the doors. It's really just down the hall here. We are very fortunate to have on our staff not one, but two highly trained professional conservators, Peter Verheyen and Danya Khan, both of whom have studied with master conservators in this country and abroad, and, how and who now regularly travel to give workshops of their own and to contribute to the growing body of professional literature on conservation practices. Joan has known Peter through the years that he has been here, and Peter will introduce you shortly to our inaugural lecturer, John Dean. We also have with us this afternoon Martha Hansen, Preservation Administrator for our main library system, who together with my predecessor, Mark Weimer, was instrumental in setting up our conservation lab in the first place, carving it out quite literally from a former kitchen area on this floor. Marty has worked over many years with John Dean as a fellow preservation administrator in the Big 11 Consortium of Academic Libraries in New York State that share state-mandated funding for library preservation, a unique program in our nation that has made it possible for our library to hire and retain our highly skilled conservators. The Brodsky Endowment for Advancement of Library Conservation, whose creation we celebrate today, has as its purpose to enable our conservators to raise awareness of knowledge of library conservation issues and practices here on campus, in our surrounding communities and region and beyond. In his introduction of our speaker, Peter will say more about the kinds of programs we have planned and envision offering through the support of the Brodsky Endowment. But it is now my privilege to present to you our Chancellor and President of Syracuse University, Dr. Nancy Cantor, who would like to share some further words of, wel words of welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Christian. Well, it, it's just such a delight to have my Chicago friends <laughs> back in Syracuse and to be in Syracuse and be able to welcome Bill and Joan here and back to their, their the heart of, I think, where their knowledge and seat of knowledge began. And it's, it's so appropriate to think about the way in which they have come back to Syracuse again and again 
to share knowledge. And really, knowledge sharing is what this is about. It's what it's about when you go to a great university and it transforms your life. It's what it's about when you maintain those ties and come back and make that sharing possible for others. And they are just a prototype of that. I think, as Kristen said, it's, it's amazing how their, their sharing of knowledge has spread generously across this institution. And it's just that kind of interweaving of different pursuits that we so much want to be at the heart of this institution. And of course, what better to do than to do it in a library? The library is indeed the seat of sharing knowledge generously. It's the seat of interweaving all kinds of disciplines, all kinds of modalities and approaches. And most importantly, it's the seat where we preserve the past, as this endowment will do. But we don't preserve the past to preserve it and box it. We preserve the past to guide to the future and to share it and to have a sense for the future of where we've come from and where we want to move to. And it's that dynamism that is part of their lives, part of their three children's lives. We, Steve and Archie and I had the great fortune to see this extraordinary house that they are, of the, of the old that they are leading into the future and renovating in Chicago. And, and I, I think of that as, as a, again, a prototype of what you want to do and what you want us to do here and, and what we will do with this extraordinary gift. So it is just um, a great personal pleasure and for the institution an extraordinary pleasure to have these kind of alums do this for an institution they love and that they know can share knowledge as broadly as possible for as long as possible as we go into um, a glorious future. So thank you so, so much. Yes, thank you, Chancellor Cantor, for introducing the Brodskys. I'd like to say thank you to both of you as well. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Peter Verheyen. I'm the Preservation Digital Access Librarian in Special Collections, um, Special Collections Research Center, I should say. And I look forward to making this series an integral fixture in the conservation and preservation community of Central New York, one that you'll both be proud of. Um, this lecture and workshop series will bring to Syracuse recognized conservators not only to speak on important topics relating to conservation and preservation of library materials, but also to present hands-on workshops that will introduce and reinforce important skills and techniques needed by conservation and preservation professionals, students, and the allied crafts and professions. While John Dean will introduce us to the issues facing conservation and preservation today, Successive speakers will focus on specific issues and techniques. I'm pleased to announce that Hedy Kyle, longtime conservator at the American Philosophical Society in Philadelphia, will speak, will fix the series in the fall, which is the spot that we've decided is, works best, with a lecture and workshop on preservation, <coughs> rehousing, and housing options October 7th and 9th. John Dean, our speaker for this afternoon's inaugural event, will speak on preservation and conservation in the digital age, a topic he's uniquely qualified to speak on as a result of his leadership in such activities at Cornell and elsewhere. John Dean is Cornell University's preservation and conservation librarian. He received his City and Guilds of London Institute Medal in Bookbinding in 1956, a Master of Arts degree in Library Science from the University of Chicago in 1975, and a Master of Liberal Arts degree in the History of Science from the Johns Hopkins University in 1981. Following his six-year apprenticeship, John established and led four major preservation programs beginning in 1960 at the Manchester Central Research Library in England, the Newberry Library in Chicago, the Johns Hopkins University Library in Baltimore, and since 1985, the Cornell University Library. He is the author of several works on conservation and preservation management, has taught conservation and preservation management at the University of Maryland, here at Syracuse, at the University of Alabama, and the State University of New York at Albany. It's, you know, it's John who introduced me to the field of conservation to begin with. And when I was a work-study student at Johns Hopkins, I started working with him, a lot of mundane things, but John encouraged and he nurtured. And if it wasn't for John, I would never have entered this field. So I owe John a really big thank you. So I'd like you all to welcome John Dean. Are you ready? Push the green button on here. You Which button? The green one. From there. Green and then we're going to need to okay. find. Okay. Okay.
it's kind of been working its way. So there you go. And then tug with eight. What? Right. Let's do this right now. This is because I have some pictures to show you right at the end here. So <clears throat> I'm going to be talking a little bit about the world that we're living in, really, as far as digital imaging is concerned, and trying to relate it to the things that Peter and I have been working on for several years, which is conservation, and how these two worlds sort of relate to one another. For those of you who are mentally prepared to have their eyes glaze over the thoughts of even more stuff on digital imaging, take heart. In this presentation, I want to briefly examine some of the perceptions abroad about digital imaging, begin to examine the development of traditional conservation in libraries, describe my own experiences in conservation, and bring everyone up to date on some of the main intersections of the two apparently diverse approaches. Let's first take a look at some of these perceptions about the electronic future and, by extension, digital imaging. In looking at the futures of future of libraries and archives, one persistent view is that book collections will eventually disappear and that everything worth reading will be on the web. But this might be a little more difficult than first thought. One of the immediate practical effects of the invention of printing was the ability to produce many copies of an author's work which tended to make the suppression of ideas clearly vulnerable in manuscript form, much more difficult as it was harder to control their distribution. The invention of the World Wide Web seems to have similar but much more dramatic characteristics, disseminating information to wild, ideas widely and making next to impossible the burning or curtailing the spread of information. Although our use of digital imaging technology predated the invention of the web, the seemingly insatiable market that the technology has created is based upon the notion of instantaneous and random access to absolutely everything. These expectations may or not be justified, but there are certainly serious concerns for preservation. Abby Smith of the Council for Library and Information Resources cautions on the possible dangers of oversimplification. So what she said. What we have found is that digitization often raises expectations of benefits, cost reductions, and efficiencies that can be illusory. And if not viewed realistically, have the potential to put at risk the collections and services libraries have provided for decades. This concern with losing what we have fought so hard to build is not just a reluctance on the part of traditionalists to slow down the clock and hang on to old ways, but is a recognition that without the necessary standards and protocols, we may be entrusting the record of scholarship to an immature medium, one which does not appear to have much of a record for actually preserving anything. Despite the charge of immaturity, however, the technology has been around for quite some time, and our knowledge on how to make things work to our advantage does continue to grow. One of our prime concerns is in ensuring the preservation and continued life of our images because of the enormous file sizes that are being produced and the need to bring to bear all of our managerial and technical skills to migrate these files over time to ensure that the images still live. The safe archiving of digital images is especially of concern from images that are born digital, uh, usually the result of electronic publishing. <coughs> Librarians cannot control the preservation of these images and worry that the images will cease to exist as digital archives once the commercial value has been fully exploited or that they will be unable to afford to preserve them if the images are transferred. But a more serious concern is the ubiquity of scanning, which seems to be done by everyone and all over the place with devices purchased from the nearest office supply stores. And, these, and there is a general lack of managerial systems to maintain images as an institutional and collaborative responsibility. This is understandable given the project-driven nature of most library digitization projects, which are really designed only to create digital resources rather than to maintain them. What is needed is a transfer from project to programs that are ongoing and which will encompass the full cycle of digital resources, from selection and creation to management, access and preservation, with a range of strategies to ensure that resources are allocated properly. 
Investigations into digital imaging for preservation purposes started at Cornell at the end of 1989. It's a long time ago now. And its locus within the Department of Preservation and Conservation surprised many in the preservation field. The decision of the department to embark on what seems such an antithetical path was essentially pragmatic, as we recognized then that the onset of the technology was inexorable, and unless we took steps early on to try to understand and manage it, we would be swept away. There are enormous benefits to be derived from di digital imaging technology once we have resolved some of the rather complex problems that confront us. Some of the benefits may involve attaining a measure of control over aspects of librarianship that have eluded us so far. Collaboration amongst libraries, especially in collection management, has always been a will of the wisp. Yet digital imaging technology offers significantly enhanced prospects for cooperation through the collective provision of information service to users who have no particular interest in the origin of the information. However, the future is not just digital technology. The problems that libraries face seem only exacerbated by the technology. Although the early advocates of digital technology predicted the end of paper and libraries as separate utilities, it seems that we, are, we cannot construct buildings fast enough to contain the rapid increase in book collections. <laughs> At Cornell University, four sizable library facilities have been constructed over the last few years with three additional high-density storage facilities now in, now in progress to add to the two existing storage facilities that we already have. The rate of circulation continues to increase with the use of rare books and manuscripts increasing by an equal amount with more than half of all its use from undergraduates. Preservation professionals have a responsibility to engage in the broader discussions on the future of libraries and try to look beyond the boundaries of their own collections to places in lands where pieces of the world's cultural heritage are disappearing at an even faster rate. Over the last 20 years, I've been working abroad on behalf of Cornell in many different countries in recognition of this fact. Uh, I actually returned only two weeks ago from Jamaica, where I was working for six weeks to help them to recover from Hurricane Ivan. Um, that was a rare treat for me because it enabled me, for the first time for a long time, to work full time actually in a bindery at the bench. We must be pragmatic and understand that administrators, especially those outside the library, are not going to be swayed by panegyrics on the principles and ethics of conservation, but by cost-effective and utilitarian solutions that will benefit the most people. Warren Haas, then the Executive Director of the Council on Library Resources in 1972, produced a still valid prescription for the nationwide preservation program but it needed an RLG to bring collective focus to individual institutions, collection development and preservation programs. Now, however, the nationwide distributed approach to a nation national system is perhaps too decentralized, with no organizing principle at work, especially since RLG largely abandoned preservation coordination some years ago. Will some of the more marginal institutional preservation programs continue to survive without the peer pressure and support of a central organization? I rather doubt it. As high-speed and comprehensive data about our collections spread and increase, will our conservation programs be capable of dealing with the consequences of heavier collection use? Will it be possible to actually fulfill the promises of our bibliographic records and maintain our books in usable condition, rather than trying to hide them in remote storage or in boxes? Perhaps more encouragingly, I sense a growing interest, at least amongst Cornell alumni, in protecting and preserving the collections, the actual book collections. And it may be that private funding is the best bet for the future. I do not see public funding agencies nor overtaxed library administrators sustaining support for preservation programs. Library administrators are wavering in their support for traditional collections, trying desperately to keep up with the new and the old. This is clearly up to preservation administrators to recognize that it is neither possible nor even desirable to preserve everything, and that they must demonstrate through objective and quantified demonstrations of need that sound and cost-effective preservation management is a vital part of the library enterprise. Expert preservation management of routine processes, information based on careful analysis of the collection, integrated with data on collection value and utility, should be the elements driving preservation and conservation programs. 
talk a little bit now about book art. So, so I'm going to shift gear when we start moving away from these macro things into some more um, immediate things of interest to me. The book arts as we know them today are the eventual result of the evolving efforts of printers, paper makers and bookbinders to produce books that are designed to fulfill their primary purpose to present and record the thoughts, creations and ideas of humanity. One of the primary functions of libraries, we were told in library school, was to preserve the sum total of human knowledge. So clearly the production and purchase of books and the responsibility to preserve them are not unrelated. The idea of preservation is certainly as old as the ideas of record, record keeping and libraries, and as we reminded recently in an electronic list devoted to library conservation, the history of preservation and conservation itself is now a field of growing, growing interest. I think an important point to make about conservation practice in particular is that a great deal is still influenced by immediate practicability. And many of our methods and techniques are based on simple observation of what has worked successfully in the past and what has not. Obviously, we apply the results of materials testing to our work and obey perhaps somewhat rather uncritically the received scientific wisdom of the day, but of course, this is what Bookmind has been doing for centuries. Modern book and paper conservation practice is firmly based on the crafts, mainly bookbinding, and it seems clear to me that bookbinders have always operated in this way, experimenting with new or hybrid techniques and avoiding methods and materials that have not been successful. For example, we were told by St. Jerome that in the library of Pamphilius at Caesarea, at Caesarea rather, uh, papyrus m manuscript books were interleaved with parchment when it was noticed that, papy that papyrus was weak and parchment strong. That all badly damaged papyrus manuscripts were automatically replaced with parchment. This is sort of an early example of refreshing. For binders working large research collections, even a modicum of observation of bindings and materials over time can lead to some worthwhile and readily ap applicable information. The quite sophisticated use of materials and flexible Coptic binding construction in early English bindings, such as the 7th century Stonyhurst Gospel, discovered in the coffin of St. Cuthbert in Durham Cathedral, places some of our lofty ideas about the superiority of modern book conservation techniques into sobering perspective. The 18th century bindings of Roger Payne, a binder much vilified by Thomas Ragnall Dibden, uh, Dibden as a dipsomaniac, are not only elegantly tooled and beautifully bound, but show the superb paper repair skills of Payne's assistant, Molly Weir. Payne's work on the great Earl Spencer Library, now largely in the collections of the John Rylands University Library of Manchester, is a demonstration of carefully thought out conservation work of the highest order. Some volumes carry still the records of his treatment. The John Rylands Library also has a few of Payne's protective enclosures that, while cleverly and novelly constructed in accordance with the whims of the day, are specifically designed to avoid abrasion to the book. In many cases, it may be noticed that skills craftsmanship was negated by poor materials, a fact not easily discernible in the past and sometimes not even now. For example, two of the great collections at Cornell University, the Dante and Petrarch collections, gathered together by Willard Fiss, Cornell's first university librarian beginning in Florence in 1881. A true bibliomaniac, Fiss combined his first book buying trip with his honeymoon <laughs> <laughs> and was soon writing to a Cornell colleague that on his first night in Florence he had added dozens of incunabula to the many that he had purchased at the Sutherland sale and he was determined that his acquisition be suitably clothed in fine bindings. But Fisk also wisely ensured that original bindings of, quote, much historic and artistic interest were preserved to document the development of binding over the previous 400 years. Accordingly, he sent his books as he purchased them to binders in England, who for the most part performed their work of binding restoration very competently. Unfortunately, while the methods they employed were excellent, the goat and calfskin leathers they used were not. And this collection is now going, undergoing, has been going, undergoing for a long time, in fact, repeat binding conservation work, again with calf and goat skin uh, um, leathers. Despite carefully selecting the leathers that we are told are most likely to last, I'm not entirely confident that binders 100 years from now will not be repeating our work. 
In some cases, bindings are suffering because of changes in shelving practices, and the binding mechanism has been subjected to strains not anticipated by the original binder. This is especially true of bindings produced before 1600. Most bindings in the 16th century were of relatively massive construction, with quarter-cut oak boards, metal clasps and bosses, and large bevel squares. The design was intended to protect books as they lay flat on their sloping reading desks, or stored flat in chests, the metal bosses intended to prevent abrasion to the covers and outer joints. The clasps to prevent the uppermost cover and the usually parchment contents from warping, and the large squares to act as a protective bumper. While these same volumes, when these same volumes began to be stored on edge as libraries increased in size by the end of the century, the structural design was wrong, and the heavy text began to slump inside the crutch like squares causing breakage to the top joints and loosening of the text. This seems to be one of the lessons that modern book conservators have failed to learn, as binding still balance ballerina-like on the points of substantial squares, with text blocks sagging to rest their weary tails on the shelf. Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail at the end when we look at some pictures. The Industrial Revolution affected binders initially in indirect ways. As the number of books increased dramatically along with the population, especially after the powering of the printing press, beginning in 1814, binders struggled with wholly handcraft methods to try to keep up with the printing impression rate that had increased by a factor of 10, virtually overnight. The only covering materials available to binders until the invention of book cloth 10 years later were leather, paper and parchment, and the only method of sewing was by hand until 1856. In desperate efforts to keep up, binders began to take shortcuts, reducing the number of sewing slips, sewing in thin cords, employing the Oxford hollow indiscriminately, using odd slow-drying glue concoctions for gluing up backs. The haste to keep up also affected the manufacturers of paper and other binding supplies, and inevitably the quality of materials began to deteriorate. The fall in quality caused alarm and panic amongst librarians, and when the famous scientist, Michael Faraday, was asked by fellow members to explain the deteriorating condition of the leather armchairs and bindings in the Athenaeum Club in 1842, this former bookbinding apprentice produced a report on, on which many modern investigations have been modelled, citing inherent vice, exacerbated by poor environment as the chief culprits of the deterioration. In fact, Faraday's report is a, is a model on which virtually every conservation report is now based. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. Faraday's report to the club committee was read as a lecture at the Royal Institution in 1843 and then presented to the Society of Arts. It was not until 1899, however, that the Council of the Society actually moved on the report because of the growing number of complaints. And in the May of 1900, the appointed committee met for the first time, with leather scientists, chemists and bookbinders, including Douglas Cockrell, Thomas James Cobden Sanderson, Walter Layton, Sir Prido and Joseph Zainsdorf. This was a really famous group, believe me. Douglas Cockrell was Cobden Sanderson's first apprentice at the Dubs Bindery, and obtained his post through his uncle, Sir Sidney Cockrell, William Morris's secretary. Cockrell rapidly became one of the most influential bookbinders of his day, largely through his remarkable conservation work on the Codex Saniaticus, and through his students who included Sangorsky and Sutcliffe. Cobden Sanderson was a friend of William Morris, Byrne Jones and Dante Gabriel Rossetti, and he founded both the Duff's Bindery and later the Duff's Press. Cobden Sanderson's view of bookbinding was naturally greatly influenced by the arts and crafts movement, and he campaigned for a return to much earlier standards of quality. He is very much influenced by his friends of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood, and he believed that early bindings represented the very best in materials and structure, which was essentially true given the hastily produced materials of the 19th century. Walter Layton was a master bookbinder, the son of a famous binder and the father of another. Sarah Prido was the author of one of the first bibliographies of works on bookbinding in 1892, and a distinguished amateur bookbinder and writer on the book arts. Joseph Zainsdorf was the third Joseph Zainsdorf to be a bookbinder, 
and he continued the famous London firm of Joseph Zensdorf Limited, established by his father. A very, really eminent committee. The results of the work of this remarkable committee was to greatly influence the design of bindings for libraries and to begin the process of critical assessment of binding structures and materials, including leather. <coughs> Their recommendations actually became the essentially the standard for British libraries for 50 years because the standards were essentially designed primarily to um, focus on particular groups of materials. And <coughs> it's, it's remarkably, remarkably modern in the way that it was written. Cockrell's Landmark Manual, Bookbinding and the Care of Books, published in 1902 and still in print, incorporates many of the com committee's conclusions. In 1904, Cobden Sanderson, who had already made it clear where he stood, was new, moved to produce regulations for a new bookbinders guild that would, among other things, promote series of lectures on methods and animal and vegetable products. In that same year, another Society of Arts member, um, committee member, J. Gordon Parker, director of the London School of Leather Manufacturers, urged binders to apply the results of the most recent research, which showed that leather should not be shaved, should not be dyed with sulfuric acids, and should not be guide gall, and should be gall or sumac tanned. My own training was very much influenced by the events going back to Faraday and beyond. A remarkable, remarkable um, inheritance here. It's possible to see where all these ideas came from. When I was 11, I won a scholarship to the School of Arts and Crafts, an offshoot of the Manchester Royal College of Art. And among the arts and crafts I experienced was bookbinding, with the primary text one of Douglas Cockrell's Elementary School Craft Series, published by Dryad. I took a look at one of these the other day, by the way, and marveled that anyone would ever think it elementary. <coughs> <coughs> My former six-year craft apprenticeship began at the age of 15 and consisted, consisted of days at the bench at Lee Whitehead's Limited and nights at the Manchester College of Science and Technology. This is now UMIS, the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology. So where my first year apprenticeship prize on the way to be to my City and Guilds of London Institute was Cockrell's Bookbinding and the Care of Books. The printing, ruling and bookbinding firm where I served my apprenticeship had been established in 1780 and at that time, this was 1951, all printing produced by the firm was letterpress using hand composed type by slugs from a linotype machine. One of the most valuable records of bookbinding was written by a man called Henry Aston, and he called it An Old Craftsman's Memories. It's published in the Bookbinding Treasure Journal almost exactly 100 years ago, um, 1905. Aston served his apprenticeship beginning in 1836 at George Schmidt Limited of Covent Garden. And this, incidentally, is where Michael Faraday uh, began his apprenticeship a few, a few years before. Aston's description of his workplace, the methods of production, the type of work produced during that period, uh, gave me the idea that I might re relate a little of my own early experiences. These types of binders have largely passed away now, unfortunately, but I, I think you might find it interesting. Work in the Lee Whitehead's binding department included delicate paper repair and hand sewing, and all binding used hand processes. Most books were either ledgers or so-called fine or extra bindings covered in sheep, calf, goat, vellum, or sealskin. All book edges were either marbled or gilded, and one of my early jobs was to lay on gold leaf for the edge gilding of a large number of diaries for the town council. The organization of the binder was essentially divided by sex, with women and girls occupying about, occupying about two-thirds of the space, the rest being taken up by men and boys. Women served as a separate apprenticeship from men and concentrated on hand and machine sewing, document repair and various other preparatory tasks. The men did most of the heavy pressing of books before sewing, and included, which included making all the complex end papers that consisted of marble paper and cloth joints. There were six men and two apprentices, one aged 19 and myself at 15. The normal work week was 45 hours, which made for a long day of standing at the bench, especially for a boy fresh out of school, where sitting down was insisted upon by the teachers. 
For the first few weeks I had to put up with the constant pranks of the men and the petty tyranny of the older apprentice until I set him straight one lunchtime. <laughs> it was the apprentice's job to ensure that all the hot glue pots were constantly full, that all the work surfaces and various implements were clean, and that new paste was made at least every week. The men were on a daily docket system. This was a system where every binding job was timed from the ledger, the ledger having been first compiled in the middle 19th century. Each day the daily docket had to be filled out by every man with eight and three quarter hours worth of work, 15 minutes being allowed for miscellaneous time. The apprentice was allowed 30 minutes miscellaneous time to enable the cleaning chores to be carried out. All the men had their own piece of a very long bench set against the window which looked out on a row of terrace houses and alleyways. The men were divided up into one man on finishing, one man on marbling, and four men binding at the bench. Every month the men would change positions, so the same men did not do the same work all the time. The main advantage with this system was that every man was a good finisher and marbler, as well as binder. The quality of work being produced was very high and every binding was inspected when the work was complete by the foreman and then by the firm's manager before being delivered to the customer. The type of bindings was extremely varied, ranging from traditional ledgers to elaborately tooled presentation bindings. All ledgers were constructed with a spring back, split boards and covered in leather, usually sheep or goatskin. Some of these were quite elaborate, constructed with full rough calf, double straight rusher bands, laced through the boards with vellum strips. Many ledgers were indexed at the forage, and I learned about the intricacies of vowel indexes, Scotch and Irish indexes, and throw-out indexes. Many ledgers had special locks fashioned out of brass, which had to be installed when the ledger was almost finished. Most of the tooling on ledgers was in blind, with the lettering in gold on the second tool panel on the spine. Lettering and tooling on a light-coloured leather, such as fair calf, was always done by picking up the pigment from a black carbon paper with a hot tool, then making the impression, which was then varnished with a tiny brush. One category of binding that consumed a lot of bench space was law reports, being bound in fair calf with each lettering panel in different coloured lay onlays of red, black, green, brown and blue and other colours to differentiate the divisions of law, such as Queen's Bench, Appeals Cases, Admiralty Cases and others. All law books were sold with five sawn-in hemp cords laced through millboards bound with Oxford hollowed, made from handmade paper. Usually one man and an apprentice would take on 60 or so of these volumes. Because of a special pricing arrangement with several law firms, the law reports were sent for binding together, and then distri distributed to the customers when the work was done. Presentation bindings were varied. At the time, crematoriums were being built in large numbers in England, I'm not sure why and Lee White has had a brisk trade in books of remembrance. These were quite large books of handmade paper in which names of the incinerated were written, with the pages being turned every day. Because the books always lay opened on a lectern, the covers were not seen, but the inside borders of the full leather bindings were inlaid with different coloured leather and extravagantly tooled. <laughs> Other finely tooled books were designed for special occasions, as it was the fashion then to present visiting dignitaries such as the Queen with books to commemorate their visits. Often these books would have the coat of arms of the town incorporated into the design, such as a drop panel. Lee, Lee Whitehead's also worked with a local calligrapher to produce what was known as illuminated addresses. These were quite beautiful leaves of parchment written and illuminated by the calligrapher and then placed into specially tooled cases. Other fine bindings were executed for private collectors, and these were in a broad variety of types and styles. One popular style incorporated dark calf, treated to produce a tree pattern on the surface. Another offered sprinkling with different coloured inks through shaped templates onto the leather surface combined with gold tooling. Yet another combined leather onlays cut with steel punches and tooled in gold with the corresponding and matching tool. Usually these designs were consisted of leaves and flowers. For me as an apprentice, the work steadily increased in complexity as I moved through the six years, and eventually I took my place at the finishing bench in the marbling trough. 
Marbling was almost always to book edges. Very rarely did we actually marble paper. Most of the patterns were variations of Dutch designs with wide combs for the thick ledges that we bound. But the patterns and colours were much more subtle for letterpress books. These are books that you actually read as opposed to write. These designs were Turkish, Herven, Nonpareil, and so on. Marbling was done using Karagin moss. Uh, this is a seaweed imported from Karagin in Northern Ireland. The moss was placed in a large cauldron with the requisite amount of water and brought to the boil, then removed from the gas ring and immediately cold water poured into the mix. As a young apprentice, I, I, I got to actually sit down doing this. I could sit on the bench and stir the size with birch twigs as it cooked, one of the rare occasions I was allowed to sit. At Lee Whitehead's, we then poured the resultant mucilage into a large earthenware pot to cool overnight before straining off the glutinous seaweed in the morning. In cool weather, the size would last about eight weeks. But in warm weather, it became putrid in six. When the size was ready, it was carefully poured into a trough and allowed to settle. The collars were ready mixed and were applied to the surface of the size, where they lay quite safely and allowed easy manipulation with combs or stylus. In order to make the collars spread, ox gall was added to the collars. The book edges had been prepared with a mixture of dissolved alum, which acted as a mordant, and the edges dipped into the surface of the size and the pattern transferred. All gold tooling was with gold leaf, as there were no, gold, no good foil substitutes in those days, and the gold was set with egg albumen. I was often sent to the cooperative store across the street uh, to buy bags of plain flour for the paste, eggs for the glare mixture for finishing, vinegar to reduce the grease on the surface of the leather, and with a short walk to the slaughterhouse, a gallbladder from which we extracted the liquid to make the marbling colours spread. <coughs> Not all the work at Lee White's was interesting. We, we had to buy lots of truck drivers' receipt books, cotton mill spindle books and the like. But even combining with the men on large group projects for routine work was, it was really a great treat for me. Conversation was constant on those almost mechanical projects. And the men talked incessantly about politics, boxing, cricket, rugby league, and occasionally bookbinding. <laughs> <coughs> the discussion of bookbinding ranged from discussion on materials and methods to historical models. And I, I was surprised that Cobden Sanderson was admired, even though he was not a time served professional binder. When Douglas Cockrell served his apprenticeship at the Dove's Bindery, it really wasn't to Cobden Sanderson, it was to a wonderful book by the name Charles McLeish. I think I learned a lot simply listening to the men talk and occasionally joining in. I served my apprenticeship at a fortuitous time. In 1951, Lee White had an enormous accumulation of work from before the Second World War. And the town's 365 cotton mills were working at full stretch, providing lots of ledger work and other residual binding benefits. In 1956, I was obliged to join the army to do my national service. When I returned in, to the bench in early 1959, much of the work was gone. Most of the cotton mills had closed down, and an air of depression pervaded the town. Midway through 1959, there was a nationwide strike, the first in the trade since 1926, the general strike. This was by the printing and kindred trades against the Master Printers Federation to try to reduce the hours of work from 43 and a half hours, as they were by then, down to 40 hours. The strike lasted six weeks, and we eventually won that one hour, the, the, the hourly reduction. This was almost ironic in a way, because the first strike of bookbinders was also about hours. In 1786, the London bookbinders struck to reduce their weekly hours from 84 per week by one hour per day. <coughs> This case resulted in the imprisonment of the five strike leaders to two years on the felon's side of Newgate Prison. <clears throat> they were released on the glorious 28th of June, and their sacrifice for the one hour per day reduction was always commemorated by Union picnics, as close to the actual date as possible. 1960, I left Lee Whiters to work at the Manchester Central Research Library, and so began my library preservation career. Thus, my reflections were established early, but are based on more than 55 years of careful observation. 
The mechanisation of bookbinding that took part, place in the middle of the 19th century clearly resulted in the production of poor quality materials and increasingly poor paper. It also tended to separate the mass production publishing part of bookbinding from the more craft oriented production of fine bindings. Cobden Sanderson's struggle against the more grotesque forms of fine binding of his day resulted in the increasing application of the philosophies of the arts and crafts movement with its emphasis on good materials and solid structures. And Cobden Sanderson's training of numbers of American women binders such as Alan Gate Starr, Edith Deal and actually spread the movement to the United States of craft binding. So far I've talked a little about the process of learning from the experience of others and moving forward to build so others can learn. Preservation, of course, is much more about is, is, is much more than bookbinding. Certainly over the last 40 years has been related more to the health of entire collections rather than to individual volumes. This in turn is influenced by the building of collections. Library collections by their nature have always grown, but their growth in size and complexity since the end of the Second World War has been really quite remarkable. <coughs> the costs associated with maintaining these obese collections <coughs> are now beyond what most institutions can afford, especially as librarians are being pushed into maintaining collections in a variety of formats irrespective of utility. Clearly, issues associated with collection development and education and selection are as much part of preservation as other aspects of the research library. And the identification of preservation priorities is sometimes confounded by a lack of clarity in the objectives of the library and its parent institution. The criteria generally used to target materials for preservation are poor physical condition, evidence of use, and significance for research. When all three elements are in place, certainly the need for preservation action is, is, is rarely disputed. Of the three, the most contentious, however, is significance, as the basis for decision-making is often quite subjective. The Research Libraries Group Conspectus provided a measure by which collections were graded in terms of importance to the nation. But this has now been dropped because ROG staff tell me selectors and curators of member institutions consider the updating of the levels too time-consuming. The conspectus actually was a, was, a, was a very good, I don't think Syracuse ever did the conspectus, but the conspectus was uh, extremely valuable because it enabled uh, a collection that was numbered from one to five. Uh, a one was a, was a level that was basically, um, if you had a collection that was a one, your collection was capable of um, teaching undergraduates and uh, doing some early graduate work. If it was a five, it was the best in the nation. Uh, it was a five slash five. It was uh, not only a good collection, but you continue to collect at the comprehensive level. Five slash five W, let me think, was, um, was a collection that you collected in all languages. So, uh, Cornell, up until they stopped doing this, Cornell had 103 conspectus level five collections. The larger the collection, the more difficult the logistical decisions that must be made about it. The number and vociferousness of the voices raised about its disposition increases, and the role of preservation becomes less clear. The use of remote high-density storage is becoming more common in an effort to contain all that the user requires we keep. Yet the user often tries to insist on full, undifferentiated access, while decrying the gobbling up of central campus space by more library buildings. Main intersection of collection development and preservation over the last several years has, has been the issue of books printed on paper that is or soon will be brittle. The self-destructing book alarm was sounded even before the first mechanical wood pulp paper rolled off the machine soon after the Civil War. But massive efforts by research libraries supported mainly by the National Endowment for the Humanities have concentrated on reformatting via microfilm hundreds of thousands of deteriorated titles to prevent their total loss. Although many titles have been saved, a growing aversion to microfilm seems to have developed among scholars and some librarians and, of course, uh, Mr. Nicholson Baker. Unfortunately, despite continuing the strenuous effort, microfilm remains the only reliable preservation reformatting medium. It also has the advantage of having virtually no recurring costs after its initial capture. Think about that for a minute. Now, we know that there are some things that are eminently suitable for scanning and things that are eminently suitable for microfilm. So we really have to make sure that we 
the discussion doesn't become polarized about microfilm and digital imaging. Most of the institutional preservation programs in the United States began to develop after 1970, with the exception of the pioneering program started by Paul Banks at the Newbury Library in 1964. And most of them were centered on the resolution of the Brittle Book program through microfilm. In some cases, carrying on in a more centralized way work that had been going on for some time. As the 1970s progressed, the idea of preservation management became more widely accepted and most of the basic operations of the library associated with preservation, commercial binding, pre-shelf processing, book repair and reformatting, were being placed under an administrator who also took responsibility for environmental monitoring, disaster planning and collection needs assessment. Nevertheless, the majority of these programs is quite weak and underdeveloped and the Hass report to the Association of Research Libraries in 1972 helped greatly to legitimize and shape them in a national context. For the last 25 years, the promise of mass deacidification has both tantalized and frustrated. While investigations into what was thought would be a vapor phase chemical solution began, the intention was to develop systems that would be very low cost, uh, just pennies we were told, because they would treat collections en masse would obviously be effective and done damaging and would have low logistical impact on collections as the systems would be applied on site at libraries and could be applied to entire collections without significant selection. Judging by that, these criteria, we're still waiting for a system that we can afford. Most recent price, <laughs> most recent price is um, between 15 and $16 per volume and that's supposed to be for nasty acidification. <coughs> Preservation of the artifact is clearly the responsibility of a librarian and the staff of the preservation department. And it is vital that preservation administrators, conservators and curators ensure that in the rush to simply make images available, institutions do not damage or destroy original research materials. Perhaps the best way to do this through scanning projects that encompass a range of preservation strategies including the creation of microfilm, conservation treatment and enhanced stability through improved housing. Preservation seems even more critical now than at any time in the past, and as Colin Webb, Head of Preservation at the National Library of Australia, has noted, we must use a variety of pro approaches supported through a strong management system that allocates resources as needed. It's important that we learn to adapt to change without losing the skills and functions that we need to continue to maintain. Increased activity in digital imaging technology has actually brought about a fresh interest in conservation, you may be surprised to know. Unlike the materials provided by commercial electronic publishers, collections captured digitally by libraries and archives tend to be mainly artifacts that are not owned by other libraries. As we've discussed, the great strength of the technology is its ability to make scarce and unique research collections available to all. Moreover, the copyright laws tend to encourage institutions to scan those materials that are older and no, are no, no longer covered by copyright. The role of conservation becomes more clearly defined by ensuring that materials look their best when they are scanned and are cared for in an improved fashion following scanning. More institutions are becoming aware of the need to preserve artifactual materials to ensure that the content information is not lost. An example of this combination of operations is a hybrid program that involves both conservation and digital imaging. The words conservation and digitization represent two different philosophies and seem to operate in different worlds, yet an increasing number of digitization projects involve rare and unique materials and scanning is often undertaken by staff who lack experience in the handling of artifacts. Sometimes attention is focused so intently on the technical requirements needed to produce and store viable images that ensuring competent care and secure housing for the artifact is given inadequate consideration. Conservation represents the care of the original artifacts both of, bo in terms both of stabilization and treatment. The definition of an artifact according to the clear um, artifact task force is an information resource in which the information is recorded on a physical medium such as a photograph or a book and in which the information value of the resource adheres not only in the text or content but also in the object itself. For example, um, the way a book is bound materials used in executing the binding, the paper in which the text is written or printed, the form of printing and illustration, the decoration and so on, are all potential valuable pieces of information that must be preserved for future 
scholars. In the context of these guidelines, artifact is taken to mean, to mean an item which, when scanned, will be retained and returned to the collection. From the conservation standpoint, it's often tempting to regard digital imaging as no different from microfilming or any other analog photography. It's all seen to reproduce the artifact. However, the ubiquity of access pos possible with digital conversion seems to add another dimension, and the special lighting requirements, exposure times and handling concerns suggest that a different response should be made, especially as many analog reformatting tasks were traditionally the province of preservation. Every digital imaging project concerned with the capture of artefacts must involve the preservation of the digital image and the original artefact. And at the very least, digitization should do no harm to the original source document. It is the overall goal of the curator and conservator to protect the artefact, minimize its physical handling, ensure that the scanning function does not cause any damage, and that the artefact is stored or treated in a secure and stable fashion. Let me give you some examples of this. Um, Cornell's anti-slavery collection is a project that we worked on, um, just finished, I think, just a year and a half ago. This actually is a real strong connection to Syracuse because the anti-slavery pamphlets were largely in the collection of Samuel May, a well-known Syracuse abolitionist. Uh, in fact, very big collection consisted of 500 bound volumes of pamphlets. Um, these pamphlets were um, all taken apart. These fat volumes were all taken apart. The pamphlets returned to their original pamphlet form. They were washed, they were certified, repaired, bound together again as individual pamphlets and scanned. The advantage with this is, you know, you're looking at a kind of material here that has relevance for um, fifth graders and it has relevance for scholars. So a, 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 a project that has really broad appeal. Moreover, um, one of the things about this is the is that the many of the pamphlets were important because they had annotations, they had uh, signatures, a lot of really important information that need to be retained in its original format. The project was successful in that it allowed the scanning of the full body of the text, which are now freely av available through Cornell's website. So it, it has worked really quite well. The project demonstrated the essential integrated nature of preservation and led to certain special projects promoted by the university librarian, Sarah Thomas. Um, she's actually started a special grants program uh, that invites proposals from Cornell faculty to transform research and teaching resources into digital collections, searchable and accessible over the web. The collections include those already held by the library, the creation of new collections based on faculty collections, the conversion of other materials held by other institutions that will support research and teaching at Cornell. So this is a really good project and it's one that uh, certainly we, we fully embrace at Cornell. Um, actually, I, I, had a, I had already drafted standards for um, the intersection of conservation and digital imaging at Cornell. So, okay. So anyway, I'm right back to the thing here. How do we get back to it? That's um, right back to the end. Okay, we just need to get back to it. I need to get back. There we go. Thanks. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Slideshow. Okay, and then you can just use the mouse and just click as soon as that kicks in. Let's make sure. Yeah, it'll come. This is a project that um, this is a project that was one of those projects funded by the um, uh, these faculty grants. Uh, I'm involved in three of these projects. One of these projects is this one in um, the, the Cathedral of Toledo in Spain. Another project is one in um, Mali, Timbuktu. Uh, another project is one in Ethiopia. So in this particular project was especially interesting because it dealt with materials that had always been in the Cathedral of Toledo. Um, this is, this might you know, sound, sound not particularly interesting, but a lot of these materials dated from the late 14th century. They'd never been anywhere else. 400 volumes of plain song music books 
These music books are about almost a meter in height, weigh about 70 pounds each. And the thing that's really interesting is that the cathedral itself, cathedral archives, has enormous amounts of information about every single volume. When the music was commissioned, when the calligraphy was commissioned, who selected the parchment, who did the writing of the parchment. So I went over with the um, head of Cornell's um, DCAPS, it's called, it's called Digital Consulting, I can't remember what it is, but, it, <laughs> but it's, a, it's a department that we have that deals specifically with, um, with these things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is what it looks like, this is a um, very large vault. Um, see the volumes are very big. Remember, uh, at some point in my talk, I mentioned the fact that these books, or books like them, should always be shelved flat mm -hmm. because of the structural strain on these materials when they're set on end. All these books are bound with heavy wooden boards. They all have metal bosses, and they're all wonderful in many ways. Now, this storage, particular storage facility is interesting because this is the most recent storage facility. So at some point in the manuscript's um, history, they were placed in a place where they got water damaged. And of course, we have to deal with the consequences of that. These are books that are damaged. Most of them are in remarkably good condition. You can see how these were sewn. These were actually sewn on uh, double hemp cords. These are very thick, almost rope-like. You can see the head cap on the one on the right there, particularly. You can see some of the water damage there in some of these books on the upper shelves. And this is a fairly typical binding. This is bound in hide, as most of these are. Most of these bound in cow skin because you couldn't find skins large enough for a sheep or a goat or any of those animals. So most of them are hide. And the leather has just lasted remarkably well. You know, the reason why they made good stuff is because they didn't know how to make bad stuff. They, <laughs> they, they, they didn't have the chemicals that we have. They made things very slowly. Skins were buried in the ground and, and um, with lime to dehair them, and remove the, um, uh, some of the grease. Uh, and it, it's quite remarkable that, as Cobden Sanderson said, we really need. We really need to get back to those days where we have materials that we can, we can really rely on. You see on this instance here, it's got metal pieces at, at each corner. And those are fairly sizable metal uh, bosses. You'll also see that this has a series of nails all the way around it. Um, this is a thin metal that goes all the way around the borders of the board. It's a typical page. And this is one that's partially opening water and mold damaged book. One of the things that we were doing here was assessing <coughs> what was going to be needed to capture these materials. And one of the things that's fairly evident here is that su substantial amounts of conservation work will have to be done before, the e before we even get to the point where we can scan them. That water damage is probably maybe three, 300 years old. So. Mm -hmm. detail of one of the manuscripts. These are quite beautiful, really, just enormously beautiful. You see some of the structure there. This is, um, <coughs> that leather actually has actually become uh, uh, unattached from the um, from the spine. It, it should be attached directly to the spine. The man I was working with here actually was a, is a, is a scholar, as a matter of fact a visiting scholar to Cornell from Boston College, a musicologist, and he's actually um, been working on this collection for the last 15 years. He's recorded much of this music with a, with a choir that he has at, in Oxford in England. And um, he has quite remarkable knowledge about this collection.
This is the view of the interior of the cathedral. We saw the, we saw the outside of the cathedral in the first slide here, but there's an enormous, as many of these buildings are, you've got this huge facade, then inside you've got this huge um, court, and this is no exception. This, build, this, is, this building dates from a uh, very early period, um, about 1200, and um, all these rooms here that are under this portico are sort of um, uh, the storage areas, um, and lots of nuns live in those little cells there. And this is the um, storage room in which the manuscripts are. We stood there just to add some scale to the illustration. So this is uh, me working with Michael Noon. And um, it was a rather rushed project, actually. We didn't have as much time as we thought we should have. But we're able, I was able to do about one third of the, examine about one third of the manuscripts. And <coughs> Oya Riga, who was the um, digital person from Cornell, um, was able to assess what the consequences of starting a digitization project would be. Water damage, you can see this thing is otherwise in perfect condition, except where the water landed over a long period of time. Again, that's water. And one of the problems with one of the problems with parchment is that when parchment is made, it's it's actually uh, sheep or um, goat or calf. The skin is um, treated with lime, usually let, left to um, ferment for a long time. Then it's put onto a frame, a wooden frame, and stretched, and scraped, and stretched, and scraped. <coughs> Leather works well because the bundles of fibers that are grouped next to one another slide over each other very easily, so leather is very flexible. When you're making parchment, what you're trying to do is to change the, the direction of the fibers so that instead of them standing side by side, they become elongated and stretch out. And of course, this, this does happen. What you wind up with is a, is a sheet-like material. The problem is, in, when conditions change, it becomes either very dry or very humid. <coughs> the skin wants to start going back to the shape of the original animal. So this is the kind of distortion that happens. Such a shame, really. There's a pen on there just to give you some idea of the scale. And this is Oya Riga, Cornell Digital Consulting and Production Service. I knew it was down here somewhere. <laughs> this actually is a department in the library that is that um, has a lot of different scanning devices, um, planographic uh, digital cameras, book scanners, uh, flatbed scanners, various types, that offers a service to the entire campus. And usually, as I said before, digital imaging projects tend really to be very much project driven. Uh, somebody will get money to digitize a particular body of material. So all they do is go to uh, Oya and her staff and they will work out the actual details of what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and whether it needs to be done in 24-bit color, how many, how many pieces of gray they need to have in there, uh, what, the, what the resolution ought to be and so forth. And um, we strongly encourage people to go before they actually write the grant proposal, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But you can see this is this is a fairly good example of um, this is going to have to be 24-bit color, going to create enormous files by the time it's finished. Um, one of the things about Michael New, the faculty member, was that um, he just had amazing. Um, knowledge about the iconography displayed in the in the illumination of the sides. It's not just decoration. Um, there's a lot of meaning in that and um, he's able to identify
particular gifts that, in, that, that enable this book to produ be produced. Um, the iconography is just incredible um, in terms of what he has dug up in his research. So, okay. Um, so these are the, uh, this is a good example of one of those hybrid projects. Um, we hope to do a lot more of them. The project we'll be doing in um, Maui will involve uh, Islamic manuscripts. The project in Ethiopia will also uh, manuscripts but in, their, in that particular language. Um, so I, I really do believe that, in a sense, the more digital energy projects you get done, the more wonderful collections that they're available to people, the more conservation you can do. Obviously, when something is scanned, you, you can't say, oh, you know, all we can have there, because we don't want somebody going to scan it again. Because the, 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 the files were lost, or because the, uh, uh, it was not captured as an adequate resolution or something like that. So we want to make sure it's done with some light for the first time. Uh, so I think one of the things that really is interesting to me at least is the, I think, growing uh, relationship between digital and conservation. So I do think conservation is real future. And, uh, I think, I think um, this is sort of the right the new face of conservation. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. I'll leave this on that with information technology for But I was surprised in the manuscripts that in the slide that on some of the pages you could see through to the next page. How does that impact when you do digital imaging? Uh, yeah. when you can see the next page? This is well some of it is so that it's see through, some of it is common sense where Original text has been raised in the new text on the top. But I think most of this what you saw is see through because you hit a, a, a thinner part of the cartridge. Um, people working on digital imaging projects are doing the field of this for a long time, but we're working on our projects, particularly IMI, things like that. It's a very serious thing. You just have to deal with it using the funds and find all kinds of different projects. So they try to filter it out from the other projects. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Still, <laughs> can't do that. Obviously, the limits are. Yes. Along that line, um, thinking of the situation out of Cornell, where you have conservators and digital imaging experts working together, um, has there been any kind of crossover technology where, you, where, for instance, a through digital imaging, you can learn something as a conservator about its structure or details that you wouldn't otherwise have known? without that technology, or likewise, the digital imaging experts learning something from you or benefiting from a particular kind of treatment. How do you get a good image of a water stain right. or damaged page or, or a leaf there? Um. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I think that's really important is it's really, we believe it's, it's, it's pretty important for the, uh, the scanners to get some knowledge of conservation so they know exactly what it is they're, uh, they're dealing with. We insist on conservatives see this material before it gets snapped, for example, so that we can make some recommendations. Um, it's just like putting things on exhibition. We, we believe that things should be put on exhibition that they're looking the best, and we believe that things should be scanned that they the best. Mm -hmm. So a lot of treatment is needs to be done beforehand. But the thing that's important, I believe, is that um, conservatives learn something about digital imaging. They need to um, attend their classes. We, Cornell has just two major workshops a year, actually six major workshops a year. Um, one on digital uh, preservation, and the other on what's called moving theory into practice on the creation of images. Um, we, have, we have a number of online tutorials on it. So there's no excuse to conservatives not, more, not knowing a little bit about this. We really need to be able to make recommendations on what the best scanning devices for some things, for example. Um, we really need to know that we're doing you go to scan materials with the large panographic digital camera, um, 
they will need to be able to convey to the scanner selling point as not to expose something uh, to intense light for that period of time. So there, there are a number of things that, that, that the conservatives really need to know about. It, I think. So I think the advantage at Cornell is perhaps the fact that digital imaging began in the Department of Preservation. And of course, as it grew, we, we moved it out. And then, out, and then now we've actually moved it out of the division. And so it's become part of uh, a much larger, uh, different context. But we still work very closely together. And as you saw my trip to, to Edo with Oya. Yeah, John, I remember those petty days in the early 1990s when digital imaging was in preservation. I remember my Melody internship, part of the part of it was doing that scanning, and I remember how easy it was to clean up a page. And when I was director of Bell for Audio Archive, I learned from the curators that on court straight line preservation of sound with you want to capture the artifact of the sound without cleaning up any communities, etc. Where is, where are the issues, or the ethical issues, even though that, I'm not sure, in terms of what's considered the artifact, and how far do you clean up? Right. I mean, what's the, what's right. a straight line scan, I guess, and then what's a filter piece copy right. scan? Like yeah, the you, master you, you, you're right. Idea. Right. I'm not sure how I was going to say that. I don't know. It was a George Washington letter, for example. It was a, a place where you put a coffee cup on. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you yes. wouldn't want to clean that up. But, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> but you might want to read what the letter said that's obscured by that. So I think, I think essentially, you have to try to do both. You have to provide, a, 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 if you like, a, an exact replica of the original, and you have to be able to provide some sort of interpretation of the writing that's on it. I think it's just fine judgment. Uh, and you obviously, I think the, the thing that works really well at Cornell, I will say this, that um, people do work well together. Um, when, when a person's scanning something that has a question, they don't hesitate to go to the appropriate curator to ask questions about it. I mean, this is particularly important. The Cornell has um, very big um, area studies programs. So a lot of the material that's been scanned right now. Right now we're working on um, a large number of maps uh, for um, city maps of China. Um, and most of these are manuscript maps. So you know, it, none of our scanners actually read Chinese. But, so we, we, need, <laughs> we need to work very closely with graduate students and the curator of the East Asia collection. So you know, we, that, that sort of relationship where people have an easy uh, easy time asking for help. I, I was just wondering what's been what's being done in the preservation of the digital images, also because that technology has is changing and evolving, and what we what we're uh, saving those images to today, we may not be able to read right. uh, 20 years from now. Absolutely. And not only that, but the storage of those images also is important, and the DVDs and what whatever else is being used has to be stored privately also. Right. Yeah, well, we we actually got into um, production scanning in the early part of 1990. And so um, and since that time, Cornell has produced literally millions of images. And we migrated all of our stuff at least four times. Now, obviously, you reach a point where migrating that stuff is not good enough. There are real discussions on uh, if there are drastic changes in, in hardware, for example, or drastic changes in software. Is probably good. So, one of the one of the philosophies that could be discussed right now is the emulation programs, programs that will get um, one with the features. So it, it's um, it is very difficult because you know there there are all kinds of horror stories about people losing a lot of digital information. Um, the Vietnam War, for example, is one of the worst documented wars in history because a lot of the information is on computers that no longer no longer function. Um, so you know there are a lot of horror stories in that but uh, I think the difficulty. I think this is I think this is clearly the big problem 
when you're working on lots and lots and lots of digital projects, um, you really have to have a fully sophisticated management system in place to make sure that all of that stuff gets made. Um, and you really have to. And I think that's the real challenge, is it's, it's very costly to have senior yes. managers making decisions on five things. So I don't think there's any real automatic way to do it. Um, I mean, you, you know this when you're looking at when you're dealing with the web. Um, you see a website get, try to get back to its own within a week. Um, I think the life of, um, of, of websites now is, is, is very short, like two or three weeks. So a lot of them happens two or three weeks. So you know, you can imagine what happens with, with, with this stuff. So it is a real challenge. I, I think we have people who are very professional and very conscious of these things. And um, I guess we just have to put our faith in that. I think we have time for one more question. I think David has John, one. following up on that question, recently the Association of Research Libraries promulgated a statement recognizing digital uh, texts as acceptable preservation formats. Um, and it had some caveats with it that said that certain uh, management controls must be in place for that to be the case. Uh, I, I think that they were primarily addressing what's known as born digital records yeah. rather than the kinds of materials you have know, been talking about. But I've talked to at least two um, ARL directors who in the last couple of weeks, uh, who had real reservations about this statement of the RL and the uh, acceptance of, of digital as, as a preservation medium. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about the born digital end of that or about the statement in particular. I guess one of my concerns of a lot of librarians is that you know, any library of record is supposed to essentially preserve that thing. So you've got to be run up your articles particularly. And uh, you, you create really serious space problems and all the rest of it. And then some um, uh, periodical publisher comes forward and says that he has to give you all this thing on the digital image. It's very tempting to do it. The problem is, when you do that, you actually give up your responsibility to preserve this material. You send it to it. Now, um, Theoretically, there are agreements that will try to avoid that. One of the agreements, in some cases, for some of these publishers, is that over time they will transfer the, the job of archiving that material to the library. You know, the library can't predict that, but there's going to be a report to do that in some way. Again, it's, it really is a matter of serious concern, um, particularly, particularly we've got these really expensive papers, like you know, like also the open um, just. It's, it's very difficult, and again, a lot of people are a lot of people are um, overtaken by the glamour of digital imaging. Like the ability to you know, press a button and have this text there. That's any more thought for the consequences. And of course, it shouldn't have any thought for the consequences. You know, use it. You know, I think the real strength of this technology is working on if it were done properly. It's working on. If you're working on Shaw, for example, a good example, a good example would be Nan, who worked very prolific, for a very long time. There are collections of Shaw all over the country. So somebody doing any kind of uh, in-depth research on Shaw is going to have to you know, get a, uh, one of these uh, one great travel tickets mm -hmm. or go to the other places. It would be wonderful when you sit on the computer and get that information. You don't care what it is. It's an university teaching you by now. Because you don't care. You don't care what everyone's saying. All you care about is the those images that you're able to manipulate. And it's a wonderful technology. But at the back of that is, is uh, I think the I think this business of um, having a preservation, you know, having a preservation version. Um, of course what you get at the computer is not is it is not like the quality of the original versions, which we would call the preservation version. The Python image we look at 600 bucks per inch is really sort of good quality. 
we can read it and say, all your Dutch books, it's just fuzzy enough, it's not really good enough for preservation purposes. See, one of the things about digital images is you can capture something with 600 dots per image. You can produce a lot of different derivatives and a lot more resolution. You can speed those things over the airways. You can't go the other way. If you scan something with 200 dots per image, it will always be 200 dots per image. So you've really got to make sure that you do, you do take care of preservation in some, in some respects. Well, before we thank John Dean again for his presentation and Joan and Bill Brodsky for making lectures like this possible, and I have a moment more of your attention. Let me remind you of two things. Well, first of all, we do have a reception where we can continue our conversation, but also down the hall to our left is where our conservation lab is, and I know Donnie will be there and here as well, and you can see examples of some of these binding structures and the equipment we use to work on uh, our books and our manuscript collections here. That's one reminder. And the second is, I think many of you have had the opportunity to sign our guest book. Uh, if you haven't, please do so before you leave by the elevator. The guest book that's hand-bound by Peter in goatskin vellum. That's a copy. So <laughs> with the, John's approval, I think. Has he, has he been a good student over the years? Oh, absolutely. Very good. Okay. So now we can uh, turn our last and Thank both John. And thank you, Dr. Cannon, for coming on this occasion. I really appreciate it.